Today's session um, is presented, as I mentioned before, by Naomi Bates, who is a teacher librarian from Texas. Um, she's hugely active on her blog, uh, YA Books and More, as well as Twitter and especially LMNet. So um, she has presented at conferences, and she has a wealth of experience with digital and information literacy instruction, and I'm really excited to see what she has to share with us today. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it off to you, Naomi. If you have any questions or anything, I'm, I'm just here, muted on the other line. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Um, we're going to get started with this. Um, it couldn't come at a better time because I'm actually doing this with the students tomorrow. And every time I do this with the kids, I just get so excited. So what I want to try to attempt to do with you guys is we're going to have an interactive webinar where I'm going to ask you questions and, and we're going to, uh, you, you can type out your answers and then we can conglomerate those together. And Emily's going to help me. Um, if I do this every now and then, it's just to see um, what's going on in the chat because that's the way we're going to communicate with each other. So the first question I have to ask you is, oh, before I go there, here is, here's what digital literacy means. There are three different um, bullet points there, and I'm just going to give you a chance to read over this instead of me reading it out to you because I know you guys can read. So just take a look at this. Okay, um, the reason that I put this up is because we may know this knowledge, but most students and their parents don't know this knowledge. And um, sometimes we take for granted that people know what we know, and that is the farthest from the truth when it comes to digital literacy. And that is why it's so important that we, get, we have this conversation with our students and with our teachers. Because I can tell you, I did this um, presentation for administration in our district, and they were just as amazed as the kids were. So um, this is just a good way to start and to give some definitions of what it is and how digital literacy works. Because it is a, one of those catchphrases. Um, some people may know what it means. Some people may not. So th there are three different definitions for it. So the first thing I want to ask you guys is, where do students go to find anything that they need for research? When they're doing research or when they're looking something up, what is the go-to place they go to? So go ahead and check that out. And Emily, if you could uh, give me some of the answers. Yeah, absolutely, Naomi. Um, a lot of things are coming in. Tons of Google, Wikipedia. Um, one person said the Internet. Pretty much everything. Ah, one person said Sweet Search. So that's a nice surprise. Um, library databases. But the vast majority are definitely uh, Google and or Wikipedia. Yep. Okay, because this is what my kids say first all the time. When I ask them where they go, they automatically go, boom, Google. Now I want you guys to, um, I'm looking for the top three reasons. Think of your students. What would, your answer, what would the answer be from your students as to why they go to Google? And so type those in, and Emily, can you give some to me? Sure thing. Um, we have. Easy, most of them are saying easy to use, um, it's very familiar to them, they have a very high comfort level, easy to navigate, easy use uh, in terms of the format, um, it's very simple, they can put sentences in that make sense to them, parents use it, it's quick. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these, these four. The, and, and you know what, this one right here, this one and this one, Form, sim, simple, easy to use, and that they're familiar. I'm sorry, those three. Those are the three main uh, things that the kids say. And if you look at everything that you guys said, you're saying the same thing but just in different terms. So I'm going to say that this is the reason why kids use Google. And so uh, before I even start, and you guys are right, Google is king. So before I start, um, we're going to take a little quiz. So just, um, I'll just do the first uh, one that pops up. So here's our quiz. We are going, I'm going to quiz you on extensions. And this is going to be interesting because you guys are from all over the place. With students, it's very interesting what they know. Um, so here we go. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to chat and watch you chat these out. So I'm going to go with the first uh, person who um, pops in. So I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> uh oh. So here we go. What does dot com mean? Okay, great, Catherine. Okay, now the next one is. It does stand for commercial. Uh, the next one is what does dot org stand for? Oh yeah, y'all y'all are right on the money with that one. That one's easy. What about dot m i l? Perfect, perfect. Okay, here we go. What about dot j p? Y'all are smart. Okay, the kids uh, kind of falter right then and there, um, and so I'm going to say dot a u. What does dot a u stand for? Yes, yes, everybody got Australia. Now, this is the one that the kids don't know, and I'm just curious if you guys are going to get it or not. Uh, what does dot ZA stand for? No, no looking on the Internet. <laughs> oh, you guys are so smart, because most of the kids do not know what ZA stands for. They usually say Zimbabwe, which is incorrect. It's South Africa. And I make a little joke that says, well, it's the way they say it. They say South Africa. Um, so anyway, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because so many kids do not know URL extensions. And they'll go online and they'll type anything up. And if they say, um, if they type up something about President Barack Obama, they don't look at the URL. So what happens is they might get be getting information from Japan or from the UK. The URL means nothing to them. And this is why I, I always uh, throw this quiz in there, because I need them to read the URLs. We also go into um, conversation about organizations. Someone mentioned it in the chat that organizations are biased sometimes. Commercial sites, they're commercial. Um, so you really have to watch what you look for online because sometimes it will lead you down the wrong rabbit trail. Um, so we are going to do a research paper on the effects of the disaster at Chernobyl. But before we do that, I want to talk about data mining. Um, does anybody know what data mining means? Anyone have any clue what data mining means? Sort of. Okay, this was very. Um, this is very interesting to me, and the only way that I can tell kids what data mining is is basically have, um, I tell them a story, and my story is my daughter is going to Texas Tech next year, and she's going to major in nursing. So here I am. I'm getting online, and I'm looking up the nursing program, and I'm looking up the various nursing programs throughout uh, Texas and the schools and everything. Um, about 20 minutes later, I get on Facebook, and guess what? All the ads on the side of my Facebook are for scrubs and for nursing shoes and getting your nursing degrees. So what is happening are these little bots are going and they're picking everything, and Google is famous for doing this. They're picking everything that you look up to tailor your searches and to advertise what you are most interested in. Has anybody ever had that happen to you? Anybody? Yay? Nay? All the time, yes. Okay, yes. Now the thing is, we know it happens to us, but the kids don't know it's happening to them. So if I go into a search about Chernobyl and somebody else does, our searches could be very different even if we're still using the same Google search because of the web crawlers, because of the information that, that Google is pulling on our personal um, information or our personal searches. So this is another reason why going to the Internet first may not be your best bet, but if you have to go there, be careful and know, know about data, um, data mining, know about your URLs, um, because that can, help you, that can help you a lot. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go online. I'm just going to go via here, and I'm going to go to Google. Okay. Well, it should come up. Okay, so here we are. So 
if I'm doing something about uh, the disaster of Chernobyl, that's the same thing that the kids are going to type in. If you look at what the kids type in, they type in the same thing that, that you type in. Um, so sometimes I might throw in there a big, long paragraph and see what they can, they can get out of this. So here we are. We're at Disasters of Chernobyl. Most of the kids skip this area, and they go right down here to, to, to the stuff right here. Um, or is it here? I forgot where it is. No, no, it's here. I'm sorry, it's all here. So there's 9.7 million results on Chernobyl. Now, usually, within the first three hits, um, there's going to be a website that keeps cropping up again and again and again, and it is Wikipedia. You can type in anything here. So I'm going to type in, um, I don't know, young adult books. No, 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 no. I'm going to type in giraffe. And so, oop, well, what do you know? Wikipedia is right there. So I'm going to type in pecan. And then, oop, there it is. That's a song, too. <laughs> anyway, um, what I do with the kids when I do this is I go, wow, Wikipedia always shows up on Google, and I ask them why. Um, and they're not quite sure why it happens. And um, so then I tell them, is, is Google more interested in your education, or is Google more interested in making money? And most of the time, the kids will say money. And I said, this is where Wikipedia comes in, because Wikipedia works the same way. They're interested in getting money. Um, but they continue to go to Google to get um, information that they need, even though it might not be the best information to get. Now, Am I saying that Wikipedia is bad? Absolutely not. It is a great place to start, especially for kids who don't know anything about their topic. They can go in here. It's familiar to them. They can read about it. But this is what's important at the bottom also, is that there's a lot of different references that they could possibly use if they were going to stay online. So um, we look at Wikipedia. And um, just out of curiosity, how many, and Emily, tell me what they say, how many um, websites do most students go to before they are done, quote unquote, researching their topic? What's the magic number? We're just waiting for some responses. Uh, we have, most people are saying three, three to five. Depends on what the teacher asks for, but College students have 5 to 10, um, but it seems like most of the responses are saying uh, 3 to 5 uh, websites. Yes, and you are right on the money. Most of the kids go to 3 to 5 websites. That's all they go to, and they think that research is that easy. And oftentimes Wikipedia is one of the top three, and that is why kids are so used to using Wikipedia because it's one of those top three searches. Um, so. They have to be really careful about that as well. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we are going to look at, oh, sorry. We're going to look at the Internet again. And I'm going to type in this, facts about women and AIDS. And you can do this, guys, on your own, and it's just great. Um, they look at the first three. And, they, and we are in a copyright. Um, gener um, not copyright. We are in a copy and paste kind of generation. The kids, if they have to, to do something, I'm going to go to this third one, they're going to bring it up and they're going to go, oh, five facts, and they're going to copy and paste it. If you ask the kids this, this is exactly what they'll tell you. Now, if you look at this website, and the kids get a kick out of this, um, there, this is true but little known facts about women and AIDS. The first thing I ask them to do is I ask them to tell me what the university they're at. And they don't get it yet. It's the USA. Uh, but they still see University of Santa Anita. So I ask them the name of the professor who found these facts. And um, they look at it and they go, well, we don't know how to pronounce that. And they'll try and they'll try. And then I'll say, his name is Dr. Juwada Lion Poole. And they all kind of giggle a little bit, and they go, oh my gosh, what a weird name. So I come down. Let's go to the work cited. 
Um, oftentimes I ask them what is the first mistake they see, and they do catch this. Thank goodness they catch this. But let's look at um, some of these sites down here. If you look at number, um, number one, the magazine. Can anybody name the magazine that this uh, article comes from? Go ahead and type it in. What do you got, Emily? Uh, the ACDC Special Report. Yes, that is correct because Angus Young knows all about AIDS and women. Not really. Um, usually I break out into song and they're, they're amazed that a librarian even knows any ACDC songs. But uh, ACDC, interesting. So then I go to number four and I ask them to read the first name first. So what's the first name of the author? Ida. What's her middle name? Tecta. What's her last name? Hoax. Now put it all together. And it takes them about five or ten seconds and then they go, oh my gosh, I detect a hoax. And then number five is the one that they, they just catch automatically. And I say, guys, isn't this a funny website? And they're like, yeah, it's hilarious. And they're laughing and everything. And that's when I bring up the copy and paste situation. And then I go back and I say, you know what is so sad? is that it's on the top three hits for facts about women and AIDS. A very serious topic, but you're always going to have these bias um, websites. You're going to have these hoax websites. And this is where you can fill in with different hoax websites um, that you find online that, that the kids find it believable. Um, and you just can't automatically think that Google's going to give you that information that you're looking for. So I always use this as an example. Um, so when I come back here, I'm going to tell them about the magic word. The magic word is file type colon. And there's a reason this is the magic word. Because oftentimes when we put something into Google, we allow Google to do our searching for us. Well, file type colon, what it does is it harnesses Google to work for us. We're telling Google what we want them to look for, not the other way around. So I was doing uh, something on school culture, and what I do is I type in file type colon, and then I will use the word doc. And doc stands for what? What does doc stand for? What we got? Oh, no, not that one. Um, what are some answers? I can't. Uh, document. Okay, what does PPT stand for? Okay, great, you got it. Okay, this is one that the kids don't know. Uh, what does .xls stand for? Yes, it stands for Excel spreadsheet, and and they don't they don't see that they don't know that one. Um, what is the document that you can pull up where you can just read it? You cannot um, you cannot alter it in any way. What kind of document is that? Okay, yes. So those are the questions that I ask the kids, just so that they they know it and it sticks with them. Um, so when I go back to the internet, I have so many of these up. Okay, I'm going to put doc. And then I'm going to type in school culture, just like I re uh, regularly do. And then I'm going to type in some dates. The dates are going to be 2012.2013. Now my question to you guys is, why am I using dot dot instead of a dash? Can anybody tell me? No one's not sure? Okay. The reason I'm using a dot dot is because Google, if you do a dash, Google sees that as a mathematical function and it will skew your search results. So you should never use a dash, you should always use a dot dot. And so when I do that, I hit search and all of a sudden, school culture, I have 73,600 hits and if you look at the front, they're all documents. Now. What I also tell the kids is that PowerPoint, who puts out PowerPoints online? What, what profession puts out the most types of PowerPoints? Can anybody tell me? Teachers, absolutely. So I tell them, if you're smart, 
you can go a file type PPT and then type in something like uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, and it will give you all the PowerPoints on Abraham Lincoln. But you have to be sure, and I tell them this, if you're going to do a PowerPoint, make sure that there's citation in it or don't even use it. So you can actually kind of steal from the teachers um, if you wanted to use a file type colon for that. Um, who usually puts out PDFs? Okay, people who usually put out PDFs are, yes, journals, academia. They're the higher education, the journals, absolutely. And so I try to tell them who puts out what when it comes to file type. But this file type colon saves them a ton of time looking for stuff. Because if I just typed in school culture, what's going to happen is I'm going to have one point, nearly 1 1.5 million hits versus the 73,000 that I get with just documents. So um, what I have heard from students uh, in the past is, oh my gosh, Ms. Bates, I wish I would have known this earlier. They have no idea about the, the file type colon, the magic word. So I always, always tell them about this. Um, and I also bring this into the conversation as well. If you haven't seen this infographic, you should. I put it out on the library website. And what it is, it's getting more out of, of Google. And so it tells you how to search. This is site instead of file type. Um, you can uh, just um, search a certain site and then put in all these parameters. Um, I didn't want to mess with the kids on this because they can look at it back on their own. This is where I use file type, and I just made it very, very simple for them. Um, here are some things, and you can also do authors. Here are some things that you didn't maybe not know. Did you know that Google will do definitions? All you have to do is hit um, define and quote, I mean, uh, what are those called? I forgot. Anyway, augury. And it will give you not only the name of it, but if you hit the down arrow key, it will give you the origin. You can choose another language, the popularity of it. It does so much stuff. It even will sound it out for you. So those kids who are still constantly going to dictionary.com to type it in, now they can actually go to define colon augury or whatever their word is and then find out way more about it than they thought they would. Um, it can do a mathematical function. I am not a math person. So if I do 2 times 47 divided by 865 and hit enter or equals or enter, it will give me the answer. Now this does not work for like calculus and trigonometry, but it does do simple mathematics. So instead of having that handy dandy little cal uh, calculator out in front of you or using this one at the bottom, uh, you can always just go into Google and type in what you need and it will bring up its own cal calculator. Um, it will convert units. I'm usually saying, uh, I usually use stone, the English um, uh, weight which is stone, and we talk about horses and stone, and then I go in and convert that for them. There's also different ways that you can do shortcuts, anywhere from zooming in and out. And the command is also the Windows button, I do believe, uh, of your, no, the Control button. The Control button if you're using PC, and you can find something on a page. And this is something that I tell the kids. If you bring up a PDF, hit that Control F, and if you notice here at the bottom, this pops up. So I'm going to type in the word um, document. And what it will do, uh-oh, huh, I don't know why, why it went away from what I was looking at. How interesting. Anyway, um, it will look for that PDF for you. And so now I have to go back to it. Anyway, I, I was basically finished with it anyway. So um, out of all of those, did, um, did you learn something new just by, by that one infographic? Did anybody learn something that they didn't know? Naomi, I saw some people were uh, mentioning in the chat before that they were learning new things, particularly with like the date range that you had mentioned, because the Google interprets the dash as a mathematical yeah. function and not as an actual like date range. Um, but yeah, there were some really useful tips in there. Okay, great. So. Um, I did put the hyperlink here so that you can go back and get to it and be able to put that on your website or incorporate it into your conversation with your students about digital literacy. Um, 
And so the next thing that we talk about, oh, and this is um, Are You For Real? This is where I type in facts about women and AIDS. And so another thing that I want to talk to the kid, I talk to the kids about, and sometimes you have to make it very real for this student, is about those official web pages. And so what I ask them is, um, I first ask them, does anybody know who Elvis Presley is? And everybody knows who he is. And then I ask them, does anybody know how he died? And of course they bring up the toilet and finding Elvis Presley and stuff like this. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Are you going to find that on the official Elvis Presley webpage? Absolutely not. Um, then I bring up someone more current and more controversial, which is Michael Jackson. And we go through and we talk about some of the things that he did that was very controversial, from hanging a baby over the banister to you know his nose pulling off during a concert to to the the Kate, you know Wonderland and all the his little friends that came and spent the night. I said, will you find that on the official Michael Jackson website? And they go, no. And so I have to ask them, why do you think if someone uses the word official that it is? Sometimes you get bamboozled into thinking it's official, and it's not. And this is the type of stuff that Google is going to give to you. At this point in the game, the kids are like, oh my gosh. And, 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 they're, and they see how hard it's getting, and why are you telling us this? I thought it was so much easier using Google. And I tell them, I'm not telling you you cannot use Google. I'm just asking you to be very aware of what Google offers. And so the next thing that we look for is images. And this is huge because kids are, um, are not really good when it comes to images. So what they do is they go to Google Images and they type in the word, what, I'm going to use the word giraffe, and they hit search. And at this point in the game, they're going to click on anything and save it or copy it and use it. Well, I tell them that there are schools that have um, cease and desist letters and um, that have infringed copyrights that, that that are in trouble for doing this. And I will say that there was one case in our district. And when I make it personal like that, when I let them know that there's something like that that's happening in our school district, they're like, oh my gosh, are you for real? And of course I don't give any details. But I said, you just can't go in here and do whatever you want to because somebody owns that. And if you use it without asking permission, then you're taking away um, in intellectual property not only from them, but also how many hits they could have on their websites. And, then, and I tell them some of the more, more daily things that could happen. So I tell them, this is a five-second rule, and if you use this five-second rule every single time, you will not have a copyright issue. And so what I tell them is I tell them to go to search tools, or you can use the cog, either one. So when I go to search tools, I go to usage rights right here, and I hit the down arrow key. And right now, everything is not filtered by license, because I ask them before I even start, can anybody tell which one of these is copyrighted and which one is Creative Commons licensed? And they're like, um, no. So I tell them, go down where it says label for non-commercial reuse. And once you do that, now everything that's on here is going to be more likely, more often than not, going to be Creative Commons friendly. So if I look here, there's the wikipedia.org. There's flickr.com. So these are all going to be from places that allow you to use their, their Im image. Now, you also have to tell them they cannot copy and paste this and use this as their attribution. This is, says Google.com. So I ask them, where do you go? And I make sure that they know that they have to visit the page. They must visit the page. And then this is the URL. Click on the picture, and then this is the URL that you would use. You do not ever use the Google URL. And you have to make that very clear with the kids. But more clear than that is tell them to use the five-second Google image rule. They can either do it through search tools, or they can use it through the cog and go to advanced search. Um, and so I asked them to do that. Now what has happened in our school district is because of uh, what has happened, um, kids cannot get into Google Images. So what I told them is that I do have a, um, another place that they can go, and it's a curated site. I call it Brook Trader Resources. It's actually for digital projects. But it's a curated site of all these sites that are open in our school district that kids can get Creative Commons friendly photos. 
Then I have all these music sites they can use. I also have these video creators, or I have these videos and converters. So everything is here, and I always give the teachers this this uh, URL so that they can embed it into their um, live, uh, into their web pages as well. Because kids, more often than not, will go to a teacher's web page than they will a library web page. And it's not about how many hits I get. It's can I get the information into the kids' hands that they need. So. Um, Always speak to them, especially when you talk about digital literacy, about images, because they think that they can go anywhere they want to, any place they want to, anyhow. Okay, so when I go back, I'm going to go back to Google, and I'm going to type in Chernobyl, um, Chernobyl facts. And so let's say they go and they're going to use um, this one. Now the next question I ask them is, okay, you can use this, but guys, Really, um, we're going to have to do a citation now. So, what are some inf what is some information that you have to find in order to cite this? And we go through the seven or eight things that they have to find: the author's name, when it was first created, when it was last updated, the name of the article, or the name of the reference book where they got the article, and all this other stuff. And I said, okay, now you have to do an MLA or an APA citation. Um, and it's going to take you a while unless you use something like EasyBib or, or something to help you along, but it still could take three minutes. And if you're doing three or four citations, that's 10 to 15 minutes that you're going to be using. I'm going to show you how to do a citation in five seconds. And they're like, are you serious? And they can't wait. Because at this point they're asking me, well, where can I go? If Google, Google's all messed up like this, where can I go in order to get information? And so I make sure that I also blend digital literacy not only with Google, but I also blend it, um, I talk to them about Creative Commons. Um, here's a link to all their licenses, and we go into just a little bit of specific detail about these. And I say every time you see this symbol, because kids are very icon oriented in this day and age, every time you see the symbol, you can know that you can use it as long as you attribute it back to that person, because attribution is on every single one. Just remember this icon, which which they do. Um, and so. After I go through that, I go, okay, the databases. And I hear this collective, oh, because they don't want to go into the databases. So I, I, I click on one, and, I just, and I'm just using Gale as an example. You can use whatever you want to. Um, I'm not promoting Gale, because I also use every single one of these as well. I subscribe to them. There's Facts on File, there's Britannica, there's EBSCO, and there's ProQuest. Um, but I usually just go back to Gale because it has some really cool features that I like. So I'm going to tell them to type in Chernobyl here, just like they would um, Google. And I also bring up a very interesting um, comparison. So I look at the whole crowd because what is best is if you can relate to the student and you can get them to start talking with you. So I'll say, okay. I'm going to take everybody out to eat dinner. And everybody, uh, you get to pick two places. You can either go to the Wiener Schnitzel Hut in the middle of a mall parking lot and get a crunchy hot dog that may have been spinning around for six hours and, and maybe some, some wilted onions. Don't even think about using the mayonnaise. Um, the mustard has that little runny stuff that comes out, and I make it out so bad. And then I go, oh, or you can go to, uh, we have this thing called Texas Day Brazil out here. It's like Fogo de Chao or some kind of really fancy steakhouse, and it's all yours paid for. Which are you going to choose? 99% of the time, there's always one that wants a wiener, but 99% of the time, the kids will pick the steakhouse. And I say to them, okay, if you are picking that steakhouse, then why do you keep going back to the Wiener Schnitzel when you've got a steakhouse with the databases? And I'm going to show you why. And so let's say that I just bring, first of all, I look at this and I tell them to make sure that they look for something that is an article and instead of a book review or something, and then, and then look at what they want. Once we click on there, I said, well, if you don't want to read it, you don't have to read it, guys. And they're like, really? And I said, yeah, because you can click on the listen button and it will read it out loud to you. 
Um, so I try to cut them off at every turn. I tell them that they can print it out, they can email it to themselves, they can download it, but better than that, if you're running late for school and you have your headphones on and you're listening to the newest Eminem song, well, just put in the uh, download the MP3 of Gail, and it, you can listen to that on the way to school, and they, they groan. Um, there are citation tools that you can use, which we'll go into. And you can even share this on Twitter and Facebook and all these social media sites. And uh, so all these places are covered. So I go, okay, five-second citation. Here we go. Ready? Citation tools, uh, MLA, download, open, boom. There it is. There, no, this is it. This is your citation. All you have to do is copy and paste that into your research paper, and it's done. It's in that citation format. Um, so at this point, they're like, oh my gosh, Ms. Bates. I can't believe that I didn't know this before. And they look at the databases differently because I spend so much time on the digital literacy section letting them know how to effectively use the Internet for anything from pictures to images to, to PDFs to documents or anything like that. And so, um, so this is the, the clincher. What I do is I go back and I say, hey, guys, remember these words that you gave me? Easy to use, high comfort level, simple. Um, think about it. Does that still describe Google? And most of the time, the kids will say, no, it doesn't. And that's when I know that they understand what I'm trying to tell them. So it's kind of like feedback without them knowing I'm wanting feedback from them. And um, I say, can you put these into play when using the databases? And they, but most of the time they say yes. And I said the one thing that separates Google from a database is a um, password. I also let them know, guys, how much I pay for my databases because it's not a big, huge secret. And you get what you pay for. And that's why I bring up the Wiener, Wiener Schnitzels and the Steakhouse because you, when, you get what you pay for. And when kids, if they're going to mess with you, you can always bring up coach purses with the girls. That always works. And Beats headphones with the boys. That always works because there's not a kid in the crowd that will say, oh, yeah, I want the dollar earbuds. No. And then you get onto their level where they're a little bit more uncomfortable saying that in front of their peers. So, um, so this is how I present uh, digital literacy to students here as well as the teachers. And I wanted to make it more of a conversation type than I did um, the actual lecture type because when, when we make it involved, they have ownership in the conversation just as much as you do. So um, with that being said, I hope that you guys thought this was interesting, something that you can use. And um, oh, easy, that's right. Easy did does have direct export with many Gale databases. Yes. Naomi, I just have to throw it in there because I saw the button when you were when you were showing um, you know how to automatically so create citations. So I figured I would just throw it in there. Um, while you were wrapping up. So um, this has been a really, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, this has been a fantastic presentation. Um, if anyone has any other questions um, regarding information digital, digital literacy, um, I know I learned a few things today. Um, feel free to ask questions now. We're happy to take questions, or rather Naomi is happy to take questions for the next few minutes. Um, so feel free, any questions, comments, feedback, um, Add them to the chat box. Oh, good. Yes, and Elizabeth, you are absolutely right. This can be used for junior high all the way up to high school. I wouldn't use it at the elementary, and sometimes you have to be real careful about the, the official web pages and what you actually tell the kids. Uh, maybe you can bring up UFOs or um, is Elvis really dead or something like that as, as an official web page or something like that. Um, the five second rule, Mary, was when, um, when I go into the data, into the internet, I'm going to have to find all this information and put it into um, some kind of um, citation. Kids don't know how to do citations. Um, so they'll bring up EasyBib and they'll do a side-by-side -side and, and copy and paste or whatever they have to do to make it work. Whereas with Gail, all you have to do is one, uh, two, three, 
four and pasted is five, and that's five seconds of citation that they don't have to do anymore. Yay, Amy, thanks for posting that. Um, that is the uh, website. Um, and I also, what I also do is I also allow the teachers to have um, the URL to all the databases, because once again, I don't care if the kids go to the library webpage to find the databases. I want kids to have the databases. And if that means one less step of not going, having to go to a webpage and just staying on their teacher's webpage where their assignment is and where everything they need is, then it makes it easier for them, then I go for it. Did the hits on my webpage go down? Absolutely they did. But that I, I know that's an excellent sign that they are actually using that on their teacher's web pages when I go and look back at that. Um, um, let's see. There is a site I'd have to look it up. Um, what's the fantastic idea about planning a year's open house? I can still learn here too. <laughs> Um, does anyone do an information night with the parents? Um, yes, I do, uh, and that is a great way to put out that database. Um, also, you can make online posters and send it out via email and stuff like that. Um, if you're going to do hoax websites, I will tell you, and you have to be real careful with um, the, one, the facts about women and AIDS, because if I go back to that, I need to show you this so that you know how to do this. Um, if you click on this first link, what has happened is the professor that created this hoax website was asked not to put it on the, um, on the university web page, so he had to reroute it. So that's why it's showing up here as AIDS facts. So once you Naomi, um, sorry to interrupt. I think you may have accidentally closed out of meeting burner because uh, it looks like oh. your screen um, did. Is no longer being shared. Yeah, so um, so you're welcome to log uh, to log back in uh, to join the chat if you want. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we can't see your screen, but all of the resources that that you've been discussing and that other people have been sharing. Um, just to reiterate with everyone who's attending today, we are going to be sending that out in a follow up email as well. Um, so Naomi, if you want to come back in, uh, you can. But if not, people can still hear you over the conference line. So whatever you want to do. Um, is fine. We still have about five minutes left uh, to take additional questions. Okay. Well, since I, since I am so sorry, guys. You know, you it, it's 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 funny because it's just like one quick click is all it takes. Um, so you're not the first person uh, to do that by any okay. means. Okay. <laughs> so what we can do right now, at, while I try to get back in, is if you have a question or even if you have a great idea, if Emily could uh, be our our moderator and our go between. That would, be, that would work out really great for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, people, if you have uh, questions, comments, feedback, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Naomi, one person asked, uh, Michelle asked, uh, do you teach younger children uh, in information literacy as in like baby steps? So do you sort of scaffold it uh, with your younger students as they, and then as they move through high school, they develop more uh, refined information literacy skills? That's a really good question to bring up because right now what our district is doing is every month all of our district librarians meet for a face-to-face -face PLC. And copyright, or not copyright, digital literacy is one of those things that we have started to break apart and started making a vertical alignment from K-12. So at the elementary level, yes, they most certainly break them up. But when it comes to the high school level, um, this whole presentation is done at one time because um, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, so because you get most elementary teachers, they're on a fixed schedule, or librarians are, and they only have 20 minutes with the kids, absolutely break this up. Absolutely. Um, you might want to send out that PowerPoint, though, or if you create one on your own, which is great, um, to the teachers beforehand so that they know step by step what you are teaching them. And it's important for, for not only the kids to know, but for the teachers to know that you are doing more than just clerking, if that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat box now. We have um, a couple more minutes left. 
Um, and then as a reminder, we will be giving an optional uh, brief 10-minute demo of EasyBib um, at the end of today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about how EasyBib teaches information literacy skills, feel free to stick around for that as well. Also, I wanted to uh, say um, I just wanted to ask a question to the group if I could. How did you like the, the group participation where I'm asking you questions and you're answering it? Was it, was it too complicated for you to, for, for that type of format for a webinar or did you enjoy being part of that conversation? Uh, people are saying, no, it works great. It's effective. It was great. I like the participation. Kept us on our toes. Awesome. So overall, very good responses. And I agree. It was, it was really fun. Yeah, because sometimes I will admit, I've been in webinars where I'm multitasking and I just shouldn't be. But um, I, I'm glad that you guys came. And I'm going to give this over to Emily now so that she can talk about EasyBib and how awesome it is. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the strand on LMNet. They said EasyBib or Noodle Tools Go, uh, which is better. So I didn't want to chime in before my webinar because that kind of sounds that kind of looks kind of, I don't know, not so great. But I, I definitely will be putting something on LMNet. I am so glad you guys enjoyed this. Um, at, at the elementary level, you can absolutely use the elementary databases. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, um, like Emily said, this will all be archived and I'll let her take over from here. So thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Naomi. It's been really great working with you. Um, and again, as a reminder to everyone before I begin the EasyBib demo, um, we are going to be sending out a recording of today's presentation. We are also going to be sending out a PDF of Naomi's slides. And we're also going to link uh, to ways that you can contact her, her blog, her Twitter, um, and any other resources that you'll find uh, valuable that relate to today's topic. So thanks again, um, Naomi, for your great presentation. It's been a lot of fun. And for those of you who do want to stick around to see the optional demo of EasyBib, hang tight for just about 30 seconds. I just need to get my screen uh, set up to share with you, and um, we'll be able to get started.